Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. This one brought to you by Wondrium. Wondrium is the former teaching company online platform now through a subscription service where you can gain access to all of their fabulous content. I mostly listen to their college courses, which are 12, 24, 36, even 48 lectures long, 30 minutes a lecture, which, as you know, you can get through in 20 minutes if you listen to it at 1.3 speed, which I usually do. And uh, let me just tell you about a course I just started because I'm interested in conspiracies. As you know, my new book uh, just came out on this subject, and I just found this course on the CIA called The Agency, The History of the CIA. And this is 24 lectures, 30 minutes each. Uh, and I just started this one, Secrecy, Democracy, and the Birth of the CIA, George Kennan, and the Rise of Covert Ops. Yes, our government has been secretly running around the world, assassinating foreign leaders, rigging for uh, election, democratic elections in uh, Latin American countries, uh, and generally spying on other countries. Yes, they do that too, but you know, here we are, a liberal democracy. Did we know all this was going on? Not at the time. Uh, the CIA, China, and the Korean War, the Iran coup of August 1953. Did you know about that? I did not know about that. Regime change in Guatemala. I knew about that. Uh, okay, what were we doing there? Uh, U-2 spy missions and the battleground for Berlin. Okay, uh, this just goes on. It's just fascinating. CAA fronts and the Ramparts expose. Nixon Kissinger and the coup in Chile. Yes, we participated in a coup in Chile. Yes, our government, open, transparent, liberal democracy, thanks to the CIA. Anyway, so that's just one of hundreds and hundreds of courses um, that you can subscribe to. If you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, you get two years of a subscription for the price of one year. So you get a full year free. Why would you not take advantage of that? Just go for it. Go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash S-H-E-R-M-E-R, Shermer. And you get two years for the price of one. It's well worth it. And, and I've just talked about the college courses. They have tons of other great content, documentary series and films and tutorials and lessons and various um, particular practical subjects as well as these heady, super in interesting intellectual topics that I mostly consume myself. And you can do it while you're driving, while you're cycling, while you're hiking, walking, doing chores. I listen to these things all the time when I'm just moving about. So check it out, onedream.com slash Shermer. Two years for the price of one. All right, thanks for listening. So it is the end of the year. If you want to make your donations to the Skeptic Society, now's the time to do it at skeptic.com slash donate. Uh, and that supports the podcast, uh, of which we are into our three over 300 episodes now. So I appreciate your support. Yep. My guest today is Matthew Cobb, a professor of, in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Manchester. He is the author of six books, including... Smell, a very short introduction. The uh, Let's see, The Idea of the Brain, a history, which you were on before, so you are yep. a returning champion. Uh, <laughs> Life's Greatest Secret, The Race to Crack the Genetic Code. So today's book is going to be a kind sort of a sequel to that, as it were. Uh, you wrote two interesting books here I, didn't, I wasn't aware of, The Resistance, The French Fight Against the Nazis, and 11 Days in August, The Liberation of Paris. What, what's, what's the connection there for you? Um, I was just, well, it was something I was interested in, uh, after my first book, which is on uh, 17th century biological history. Um, oh, I, I didn't know about that one. Yeah, there was a book called Generations about, uh, the 17th century secrets who unraveled the secrets of sex, uh, life and growth, it's called. Anyway, um, we were discussing what would be the next book I would write with my publisher. We had a boozy publisher's lunch. Those things existed back in those days in the London Square. And uh, all I could think of was kind of basically versions of the first book. It was a bit like having a second child. You can only imagine it's going to be exactly the same as the first one. Anyway, he was literally falling asleep. Um, and so I just kind of desperately said, well, I could write you a book about the French resistance, about which I knew virtually nothing. Uh, and he said, right. He, he looked like he'd been poked with a cattle prod. He said, right, tell me about that. I, I, knew, I did actually know a little bit, but not much. Um, but I did live in France for a long time. And... Like many people of my age, it was part of the kind of culture uh, as I was growing up. So I decided to, to write a book about it and then wrote a book, a day-by-day -day account of the liberation of Paris. Nice. Well, the new book here we're under discussion today is called As Gods. I think it has a different title in England, right? 
I don't know why they do that, but I, I like this title, As Gods, A Moral History of the Genetic Age. So again, it's something of a sequel to your uh, previous book on, on uh, genetics and so forth. Why this book right now uh, and now? Well, it was partly a, a, partly kind of a, a consequence. So I was working on a, a, a translation. I was translating a, a book by a French historian called Michel Morange, uh, and he'd written a book called The uh, History of Molecular Biology, which I translated in the 1990s. And he produced a huge, great, big updated version of it uh, called The Black Box of Biology. And I was thinking about this as I was translating it and, you know, think, and I thought, wait a minute, there's virtually nothing in here about genetic engineering. It was a tiny little bit about what happened in the 1970s. But that was about it. And then I thought, well, what? Is there a book about this? Is there a kind of study of what's happening? And that that melded with something which I, I start the book with, which is absolutely true. The three things that I am concerned about and have been speaking to the general public about for the last uh, six years or so, six, seven years, I've made BBC radio programs about and so on. That is the, uh, the possibility of genetically engineering humans, uh, gene drives, which can shape ecology and also gain of function studies uh, on dangerous pathogens. And so the two things kind of came together in my head. I thought, well, okay, I can write this history that doesn't exist. I'd like to read it. So it's not there. I'm going to have to write it. Uh, and I can also try and bring it yet again to the public, uh, my concerns about these, these three areas. And this kind of happened at the beginning of lockdown. Um, and remarkably, I mean, I was in a terrible state, like most people, I was very anxious and all the rest of it. Um, you know, it was obviously also the dying days of the, the Trump administration. So I was very, <laughs> being a Twitter addict, it was kind of doubly frantic. Everything was awful. I was just doom scrolling. And yet I was able to, I couldn't watch any fiction, couldn't read fiction, couldn't watch films, but I could write. And not only could I write, I ended up making a, a three-part podcast for the BBC about this as well. So uh listeners can go to the bbc website and find uh find the the voices behind some of the stories i tell i, I love some of the uh, photographs you have in here because you know it's so, so 1970s all right yeah. think, like like down here is david baltimore with his mountain man beard and the aviator yeah. glasses and you know that kind of 70s look with the bell bottoms and all that stuff as a reminder this isn't that long ago this no, is pretty indeed. recent uh, history that well i mean for for some people, it's it's their history, you know. So it was uh, right. it was remarkable to talk to many of the people who were involved in this and get their 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 versions of it, their views of what happened, and to try and you know bring that uh, that those memories, those insights, those anecdotes. You know, I mean, Baltimore told me about how when he was discovering reverse transcriptase, this is the enzyme that turns uh, RNA into DNA. That was in the middle of a load of protests uh, uh, in uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, over the Vietnam War, and he was, you know, spending half the time in his lab. And as soon as the experiment finished, he went out back on the streets trying to stop the students getting arrested and and so on. So it was a, uh, it was, you know, it was history in many senses, and it wasn't that wasn't that long ago. Right. Uh, and the other thing I met by why this book this time is there somebody like a Greta Thunberg. Against genetic engineering now that's out there marching and you're trying to respond to you know these no, fears? No, no, not at all. If anything, I think it's the other way around. So what I sensed and uh, when I talk to people about, about these, these various areas, they're always, especially gene drives, but all of them, they're, they're always very, very alarmed. But in the, I think in culture, and this kind of comes out in the, in the final chapter or two, in culture, we've kind of forgotten about it. <laughs> It's a bit like, uh, I mean, I, I know we've got the, I know we've got the threat of, you know, nuclear weapons. We've got Putin rattling his saber and all the rest of it, and that's that's not a joke. Terrible things are happening in in Ukraine, but, you know, we're not in the 1980s anymore. We're not living through the Second Cold War or through the uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The threat of nuclear annihilation has, you know, kind of re receded quite a bit, and I think the same thing has happened to our concern about potential bad aspects of genetics and that's partly what i wanted to investigate because as i said i was aware that you know i was these these three areas in particular i'm concerned about but i also recognize that my fears are very similar to those that have been raised repeatedly and have turned out well not to um 
not to have been unnecessary or, or mistaken, but rather, you know, the, our worst fears have not been realised. None of the things that people predicted at any point, either the good or the bad in general, both sides, uh, have actually come to pass. And so I wanted to kind of confront my own sus fears, suspicions, doubts, whatever you want to call them, and say, well, you know, put them in a historical context. Say, well, is this the same or is there something different? Should I be worried or can I just go, yeah, well, this is, you know, it'll all be fine. Trust the scientists. <laughs> yeah, trust, trust the scientists. Here's a reminder to our listeners. It's a, a picture you have of a protest sign yeah. at the AAA, AAAS meeting in 1977. We will, quoting Hitler, we will we will uh, create a perfect race in yeah. response to the idea of genetic engineering. Okay, so that, so I mean, I, I describe that as the first real life uh, expression of Godwin's law, which is that uh, yes, any discussion right. on the Internet will. <laughs> rapidly turned into discussion about the Nazis. And that was, yes. I mean, they weren't talking about, you know, genetic engineering humans. Maybe they should have been thinking about that, not or thinking about the ethical issues. Um, all they were wanting to do was to, you know, fuse DNA from microbes and, uh, uh, and viruses and see what happens. But that's, that's the kind of exaggerated response we had back then. And yeah. in a way, nothing has changed. They just didn't have Twitter. That's right. Yeah, right. They had to physically go out there with <laughs> banners. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's an interesting point you make that the fact that these things haven't happened, the doomsday scenarios in the 70s and 80s, they haven't happened. And so the question is, why is that? Is it social norms uh, such that, you know, the, the idea of a designer baby to make them all blonde hair, blue eyed like Hitler would do? Uh, it just didn't happen. Be why? Because that's not was ever never going to happen because that's not what people want. Um, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, the things that people were worried initially about in the 70s, or some of them, uh, didn't happen. So uh, for kind of technical reasons. So one of the things that people were very scared about was what would happen if we put a human gene into a bacterium and it started, uh, it started producing whatever protein or, or whatever. That was seen to be very, very dangerous. Now, it turned out... Nobody had any suspicion of this, but in 1977, it was discovered that there's a qualitative difference between the genes in a human or in any multicellular organism and those in a microbe. Our genes are virtually all in bits. They're interrupted. They've got bits that are going to turn into RNA and then eventually a protein, and then other bits that don't seem to do anything or are involved in some subtle regulation. So our cells can read where the message begins and where it stops chop out the bits that aren't relevant, and then stick the message together. Uh, a bacterial cell can't do that. So if you were to put a, you know, a full real human genome into a bacterial cell, it would just go, does not compute. I don't know what you're asking me to do here, and just kind of metabolize it. So nothing bad would have happened. But I think that the key thing is that the, uh, the fears which led to very stringent biosecurity protocols in terms of, you know, how you can, under what conditions you can do the experiment, some experiments, whether you should do them at all. Those biosecurity protocols turned out to be pretty good. And they, I mean, they're necessary because people could get ill or whatever, but they will also protect, in general, stuff from getting out into the wild. Now, that hasn't always happened. Uh, there have been lab leaks of non-manipulated uh, viruses that people are studying. For example, SARS, which uh, was kind of a precursor to COVID at the beginning of the century. And we dodged a bullet there. We were very lucky. It didn't turn into a pandemic. Only, in inverted commas, a few hundred people, mainly in China, died from it. And it was kind of stamped out by basic public health measures. But... Uh, that virus has escaped from labs and has caused very local transmission before the same kind of process has happened. So these these places aren't, they're not completely secure. I mean, there are people involved and we're, we tend to make mistakes. Things go wrong. Um, so the biosecurity was pretty good. Some of the things weren't actually a problem. Uh, and then there came the prospect of making vast sums of money by engineering bacteria to, say, produce insulin, which has been one of the most amazing changes in uh, our methods of production of certain substances, certain drugs in particular, we can now produce in microbes relatively straightforwardly. And this at a time when the global economy was in a bit of a state uh, in the 1980s was seen as a great, uh, you know, a great new 
and a new vista of capitalism. Plus, there was a lot of speculation, and it was the big growth in um, in uh, in venture capital. Uh, really began in the 80s on the back of, in particular, Genentech, which is still around today, although it's now uh, it's now been bought up by buyers, not not an independent company anymore. Um, but the uh, this this actually meant that attitudes began to to shift until, of course, we started to get plants in the fields, and then there was with GM crops, there was a lot of doubt and dispute, and there still is, and this differs in different countries which have dealt with this in different ways. In the US, you've had basically, you haven't been allowed to know whether you're eating GM, GM food or not because it wasn't supposed to be labelled. You weren't allowed to have it labelled. And then eventually the only labelling you've got is a, an unhelpful QR code. Uh, if you want to find <laughs> out, you know, you can scan it and it'll take you to a website. In, in Europe, we don't, and that includes the UK for the moment, uh, we have the same regulations. Uh, there's no GM food in the human food chain, but we import GM grain and feed it to animals and then eat the animals. Of course, there's no no evidence at all that eating GM food is bad for you. Um, but on the other hand, the all this you know incredibly clever work on plant genetics, which I I didn't know much about before reading, was absolutely stunned by quite how smart they all were. I was also amazed to discover that, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, it hasn't actually led to an increase in productivity. So we're producing these GM crops, which have reduced the amount of insecticide that's dispersed around the planet. And that is a good thing. But in terms of what you might expect, well, that will lead to increase in productivity. That doesn't seem to happen because the strains of plant that we can manipulate aren't necessarily the ones that produce overall the best crop level so we're kind of running to stand still so in other words uh, uh, with genetic engineering instead of uh sci mad scientists using this to take over the world they just want to make money <laughs> well and that became pretty important you know i mean and some of them did make a, an awful lot of money her boyer who's one of the people who came up with the the the, the kind of the, the the additional way of uh, engineering microbes, the first discovery being made by Paul Berg, who won a Nobel Prize for it. And then kind of 18 months lo later, um, Herb Boyer and Stanley Cohen uh, came up with a what, in fact, we, we now ended up calling cloning. And this basically made it possible to get bits of DNA from any two species and stick them together. Uh, they patented that method <laughs> and Bo uh, Boyer set up Genentech and became, when it went public in 1980, became a multimillionaire overnight uh, but carried on working in the lab so there, there was i mean in the in the 80s there was a, a great influx of uh venture capital into biotech the creation of lots and lots of startups in the hope of both making a great product but also getting filthy rich mm -hmm. right so um <laughs> in a way you're also arguing that the norms and standards that the scientists themselves set up and self-imposed like at a Silomar, actually do work well they did in a way i mean they did it so a cinema is this big meeting that takes place in february 1975 they've uh come up with the idea of genetic engineering it's turned into a reality and with this new development by boyer and cohen people start to get very alarmed that yeah you could do anything and so there's a general agreement uh that everybody will stop doing anything so there's a moratorium from 1974 onwards uh, which is obeyed, as far as we can tell, all around the world, as far as we can tell. And then they have this meeting in uh, Silomar in California, because that's where Stanford regularly had their kind of, you know, their, their away weeks when they would go out on a conference. Um, and uh, it was run partly by, mainly by Paul Berg, who was at Stanford. So that's why they're in a cinema. And they, the reason why they went to a cinema was, in fact, to stop the moratorium, to start work again. So they had to come to an agreement on the protocols, the biosecurity protocols that would allow this to go ahead. And they refused to discuss. They explicitly said at the beginning, David Baltimore says at the beginning, you know, we will not discuss uh, the potential uh, engineering of humans. We will not discuss uh, the e ecological consequences of this. We will not discuss the potential for bioweapons. And that last thing in particular, uh, we now know, and this I, 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 I discovered in doing the research, that at Asilomar, the there was a Soviet delegation. And the Soviet delegation was full of blokes in their 70s, you know, men with 
even whiter hair than me, who were at the head of the Academy of Sciences, and all the young Americans who were at a cinema, in, in, you know, they were sneering at these people as being old duffers. They didn't get it. You know, it wasn't that they were hiding anything. They didn't get it. But we now know that three of the members of the five-person delegation had, in fact, already started with the support of uh, President Brezhnev in, uh, in the Soviet Union, had started a, 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 a biological weapons program using genetic engineering. And for the next 18 years, well, until the collapse of the Soviet Union, that carried on and was successful in producing you know, bizarre and terrifying uh, new agents that, if they got out, would cause havoc. So cinema did succeed at one level, but it and it's 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 great virtue was that they came up with this set of protocols which made a lot of sense and similar decisions were made in in Britain, for example, very similar kind of levels of biosecurity were adopted, but they didn't take on the ethical issues they which because they argued this is not an immediate practical concept. there's nothing practical that's any happening, but that just wasn't true. There were potential ecological consequences if some of these bacteria got out. They didn't know, but the Soviet Union was building these damn things. Uh, and also, medics were already thinking about how they could use genetic engineering on, on humans to cure genetic diseases. So, you know, they, they avoided the ethics, and that was a mistake. I think that was a, a weakness. They would say, if we'd had that, we wouldn't have been able to talk about the... the, the the, the biosecurity protocols. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I wasn't there. You know, maybe they're right. But I think they were wrong. <laughs> so, well, I guess on the, the norms issue, um, let, let me use, no, let me come back to something analogous that you started with nuclear weapons. You know, ever since Stanley Kubrick, you know, scared the crap out of all of us with, you know, the, the Dr. Strangelove scenario, and there's, you know, a half a dozen movies like that all the way up to the, you know, the, what was the one Reagan saw in the, 80s the day after tomorrow no the next uh what was it the day after tomorrow the or whatever day, the, the day after the next day comment, the day yeah. after something the like that after, yeah. yeah and he watched that and went holy crap we, we can't <laughs> this can't happen on my watch so maybe these kinds of scenarios because you write about all those those great uh, books and films like the andromeda strain brave new world the boys from brazil gattaca jurassic park the manchurian candidate all the way back to mary shelley's frankenstein Maybe those kinds of things actually do work in a more subtle norm shifting way. I mean, we haven't used, used nuclear weapons since yep. 1945. Biden just said last week, you know, when asked if you said something to Putin about nuclear weapons, don't. <laughs> you you <laughs> yeah. don't even think about it. Or to Kim Jong Un, you know, if you do this, there's not going to be a Kim regime. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe that's enough to scare the crap out of people like, okay, we really better not do this. Well, okay, that might be possible. But I, I'm very struck by the fact there's a difference between. How cultural, cultural creators, so you know, artists, writers, filmmakers, or whatever, treat atomic weapons. They're not very interested in them anymore. Uh, genetic engineering, nothing of any impact this century. You know, there's been. I mean, I don't count the Jurassic Park, you know, sequels because genetic engineering plays. It's it's not actually relevant. This is just the this is the magic wand that gets you to having a rampaging CGI dinosaur, which is the whole point of the film. But there's no, you know, they have not been interested in those issues. So that sense is, seems to me that they they don't think there's some anything interesting there to say. But if you think, say, about AI, you can't move for uh, films, thrillers, you know, comics about AI, and nothing new has happened in that respect. You know, the the the, the, the most exciting it's got is these things that can draw you a picture of, you know an astronaut riding a horse. And, you know, I mean, it is, there, there are plenty of alarming things to be worried about. I don't get, me, get you wrong, but I, I'm just struck by that difference. Creators find that interesting, but they don't seem to think that genetic engineering contains jeopardy, menace or whatever. I mean, there's never been a film or a book about GM crops. And you would have thought, given all the hoo-ha there was in the 90s and the suspicion that still lurks. If you talk to people who aren't happy, they get very, you know, there's something very deep about what they, they feel about, uh, about GM crops. It's very profound. If, if you say to somebody, if you take insulin, it's made in a genetically engineered microbe, they, they don't, I mean, that doesn't seem to be an issue. But eating something, and this is a huge issue in China, which again, I, I only discovered in research in the book, China is having massive debates about GM crops in general and in, 
in particular, of course, about the possibility of producing GM rice because it's got such cultural power and there's been already huge scandals about uh, food security and you know, various adulteration of food in all sorts of terrifying ways. So the, 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 the Communist Party is, is in fact split over whether this is a good idea or whether it will in fact cause you know, great unrest. And as we can see at the moment, they're, they're very concerned to avoid unrest and they try and stamp it down. So there is a big debate in China public debate, amazingly, about GM crops, about whether it's a good thing. There have been protests about, you know, the Chinese uh, various companies buying up European and American biotech companies and producing GM crops elsewhere and so on. But it's, it's something about food, I think, which is deeply psychological. I, I'm not quite sure what the answer is. But you contrast yeah, I, that with AI and, you know, it's striking. Yeah, yeah on, that, on the food thing in religion, because uh, religions have always had food taboos, right? So uh, for various reasons, maybe there's some practical reasons why you shouldn't mix these kinds of foods or whatever back in the day. Uh, but maybe it's also kind of a way of uh, kind of the sanctity of the human body because yeah. it's also they're obsessed with sex too. <laughs> so there's something about sex and food and the body. And so maybe that's what the kind of the GMO denialism or hesitancy uh, comes from. Because that's more on the left than the right, politically, right? The, uh, that kind of GMO uh, skepticism. Yeah, I mean, what, what's striking is that the, what happened with GM is, was in, it was in, the kind of, the world went a bit mad in the 90s. <laughs> that's what I, my decision in reading, reading, the, or re, you know, reading reliving, because I was there and remember it all. So on the one hand, you had the development of GM crops. The first GM crops, so that, that was the flavor saver, this tomato that didn't actually didn't save its flavor it would just last a little bit longer on the shelves that was the first commercial uh crop that was grown developed in the u.s and it was okay but it was just a tomato and the company made a series of really crazy decisions but nobody was hostile nobody was ripping out the the the, the crops or you know protesting or anything like that but at the same time in the uk we had the mad cow disease, which was this terrible neurodegenerative disease in cows, which it eventually turned out after about five, eight years of government denial, could get into the human food chain and could kill people. And about 200 people around the world died horribly, almost certainly from eating contaminated British beef. So there was this suspicion about you know, what they, whoever they are doing, and then you had the World Trade Organization, where it was very clear who they were. It was the USA, which wanted to get rid of all tariffs and were, I mean, I was living in France at the time, which was incredibly sensitive to this because it wasn't only about food. It was about culture. You know, you're making us consume all your films. We don't that. We, you know, because the, the WTO wanted to get rid of all tariffs and all the rest of it. Um, and this was seen very much as, a, again, the imposition, globalization, it was called this imposition of a system that we weren't consulted on. And so GM crops kind of got wrapped up in that because they were one part that the WTO wanted to remove all tariff barriers on. They wanted to say, well, yeah, you're going to have to, you're going to sign up to the WTO. You're going to have to accept uh, having GM crops in your countries. And people got very cross and there were demonstrations and, you know, riots in Seattle and all sorts of, you know, wherever the WTO went, there was a, a huge demonstration and, and fighting and that all came you know gm crops were got mixed up in this and became part of this um i mean i guess these days somebody would say it was all bill gates who was behind it you know there was <laughs> right. it was never defined who was doing this and why they were doing but they uh were trying to impose this uh for nefarious reasons that was the suspicion and i guess that was partly um i guess you're right that that's that's a that was more a kind of thing of the left, but it was tightly linked to the WTO uh, change in imposed changes in, um, in, in, in politics and economics around the world. Yeah, you know, on that kind of purity issue, because when I say something like, well, we've been genetically modifying crops for 10,000 years, here's a little what the corn used to look like, and now it's this big yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then you'll hear, well, no, no, that's not it. It's the introduction of a gene from one species into another. That's a... That's a qualitative difference from crop uh, selective breeding of crops. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes and no, uh, because, of course, we now know, uh, and this has become apparent, that what's called horizontal gene transfer, so transfer between species, 
can happen. It doesn't happen very often and it shouldn't. It shouldn't happen. It's not supposed to, but it happens where you get microbes, um, viruses, uh, bacteria that end up transferring DNA from one species to another. So it does happen. So, for example, it can happen in animals. It's pretty rare. But here's a bizarre factoid for everybody. Um, a huge, about half of the cow's genome has come from snakes. And it came from snakes via what? ticks. Well, what? <laughs> these are, so this is inert DNA. It doesn't do anything, uh, right? right? It's DNA right. that just copies itself. And a tick bit a snake and then went on to bite a cow or an ancestor of a cow. And uh, at one time when that happened, it, DNA was transferred and somehow found its way, in fact, into the ovaries of the sperm of the cow that was, was bitten. And then these, these um, bits of DNA started copying themselves. They don't do anything. They're quite, we've, we've got about the same proportion, not from snakes, but a big chunk of our DNA is just this junk that's replicating. So horizontal gene transfer does happen. But I think the key point is that the issue about GM crops and why, uh, for example, in the UK, we're having a big debate at the moment about the possibility of having uh, precision engineered uh, crops that, where you've just changed one or two letters. The difference is that the, the way that the DNA was inserted into the, into the plant was more or less at random. You had no control over it. And sometimes it did produce mutations. So the plant, I mean, these were generally ha -ha, weeded out at a fairly early moment because uh, the plant would not be as healthy or whatever, you know, weird coloration or whatever. Um, the other thing is that often you ended up or you used in the process to identify when the transfer had been successful. You used microbi micro anti -micro antibiotic resistant genes. So genes that enable the plant now to resist uh, microbial infection and to resist antibiotics and to that mark them as having been successful. So people then thought, well, wait a minute, I'm going to eat that and I'm going to end up being resistant to antibiotics. That doesn't sound like a good idea. So you, it was partly the technology is rather crude compared to what we can do now. So the plant technologists, the, the, you know, the agronomists are hopeful that with modern gene editing, which should in principle be much more precise and able you to simply change a few letters of DNA to say, make a plant uh, you know, better able to cope with uh, drought conditions, that that will overcome this, these doubts and these fears uh, in the public that there's other stuff in there and that's mm. weird and I don't want to do that and who wants to eat a <laughs> tomato tasting of a fish or, or whatever, you know, strange idea uh, they, they may have. <laughs> When I go into Whole Foods uh, stores here, it's almost like a, it's almost like a cathedral for food. You know, it's just so pure. And every other package has, you know, no GMOs here, and gluten free, and organic, and natural. And you know, so when I get invited to one of these dinner parties where they ask you if you have any food preferences, I say I want only GMO foods and extra gluten, <laughs> please. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, come, come on, it's a little too much there. Um, I do wonder on that on the purity thing what you think about this, and I've asked a lot of people this, and I don't know what the answer is. Why is there vaccine hesitancy, but there's no antibiotic hesitancy? Well, indeed, I mean, the, it, it is very strange. Um, I think it's the injection business, um, and you know, it's the yeah, it, uh, injections don't help. I mean, a, a lot of us, uh, you know, when we had our polio uh, medicine uh, or vaccines, it was done on a sugar cube back in the day. Um, and I'm sure that was much more amenable to children. And whenever you have a, uh, an image of vaccination, it always features a, a child crying with a very threatening looking needle coming into their arm. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but I think it's the same. There's something like the difference between taking a medication, take, you know, taking insulin, which you have to inject, of course, uh, you know, GM insulin, all insulin today is GM. And that's good because the alternative was to use, uh, insulin that you gained from either uh, from pigs or cows or sheep where you had to grind up their pancreas. And that, that insulin is not exactly the same as human insulin. So the genius of Genentech who came up with this idea was that they would take, uh, it's not actually insulin, it's nearly insulin because the human cell doesn't make insulin, but it makes the, the immediate precursor of it. 
to to put in they they didn't know what the this is all in 1976 it's quite amazing i was stunned by this part of the story they they didn't know what their dna sequence of insulin was because nobody had sequenced any dna at that stage this is still another year in the future but they did know what the protein uh, sequence the amino acid sequence of, a, of the insulin protein was and the genetic code that is the link between the amino acids and three letters of DNA. Each amino acid is encoded by three letters of DNA. That's known. Now, the intriguing thing is that link is not constant. That is that there are some uh, amino acids which are encoded by several groups of three letters or codons and a few that are just encoded by one. So when they, uh, the Genetech scientists said, OK, what we're going to do is going to make some artificial DNA that corresponds to this amino acid sequence, which will enable the bacterium to make the precursor of insulin, they almost certainly didn't, in fact, choose the actual DNA sequence. But it didn't matter because they were what they were really interested in doing was turning the microbe into a factory, into saying, right, you're going to churn this stuff out. We're going to give you the instructions, make this set of amino acids, stick them together, and just do that over and over again. And then we can harvest that, extract it, and turn it into insulin. And that was absolutely brilliant. So there you've got something completely artificial, completely pure in a way, and better than what was previously available. And that was one of the ways they sold it. And they also, of course, sold it on being very cheap to make, which it is. And yet, mysteriously, in the USA, you're paying hundreds of dollars for, for insulin, whereas it costs, I don't know, about a dollar a shot or something like that. But that shows you that it's not all about technology. It's uh, the difference between your national health service and whatever it is we have here, <laughs> <laughs> which is something of a mess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One last point on that, because you brought up AI and, you know, now the the scenarios are that, uh, you know, a terrorist organization will, will um, you know, take over your computers or the one I often hear because I drive a Tesla is, you know, somebody, <laughs> since your your car is online, so somebody could take over your steering wheel and drive it into a wall. And then I hear scenarios like, well, then they could take over all the Teslas at once and have a mass terrorist attack. <laughs> they drive them all into a wall on the 405 freeway and, you know, kill thousands of people or, you know, and so on. Well, if they could do that, why aren't they doing that? I mean, uh, well, you know. And, you've and, just and, given or, them oh. the idea, Michael. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be your fault. <laughs> or, you know, I, flying I, pl you know pl planes yeah. are online. Why can't, why don't terrorists take over airports and, and, and airplanes and so on? So maybe back to your uh, earlier point, maybe it's just way harder to do in terrorists. It would take a state to do something like that. So we have yeah. the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but, you know, the, you know, two or three terrorists working in their basement, they, they, they can't do that. It's just yeah. too so hard. Th at the beginning of the century, there was something called synthetic biology. Everybody got really excited about it. Uh, and there were biohackers who were in their basement, uh, but, you know, hacking bacteria. But all they could really do was, for example, make E. coli, which is a, a gut bacteria, the, the, a version of E. coli, which is not safe and it won't make you ill. Uh, all they could do was turn it blue. And so in the end, they got a bit bored with that. The, the, the problem is that one, the genetics is very complicated. And although it's easy to understand, so when people say, as they have been since uh, Boyer and Cohen invented gene cloning in 1973, people have been saying, oh, well, a high school student could do this. And that's true in principle in that you can explain it to a high school student and they can get it. And with a sufficient training in the lab, they could then carry out the process. But to actually make it work, uh, to do anything of any real interest or real threat to, you know, weaponize any particular, uh, any, 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 any particular microbe. That is actually very difficult. And then turning it, you know, distributing it, succeeding in the lab is one thing, but then making it go everywhere is very, very hard. And in, interestingly enough, I mean, people have studied this about the, what is possible. And it's very clear that the papers that describe the, how you can change bacteria sometimes in very alarming ways generally are not those that describe how you can turn that into a weapon that you could, you know, spray around the planet. Now, clearly states know how to do that because they have bioweapons, you know, uh, and not just uh, the ex-USSR and whatever fragments, uh, you know, kind of went around the world. China, probably Israel. I mean, the US has defensive measures like Israel. I don't know what a defensive biological weapon is. <laughs> But that's how they say, well, we're, we're, it's, just, it's just for defense, of course. Um, so they know how to do it. I'm convinced of that. Absolutely. 
But these aren't things that are in the public domain and making it work is very, very hard. So we all learned about PCR uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and everybody's having a PCR test. Now, any, any student who's been in a lab and tried to do PCR knows quite how difficult it is. <laughs> when you don't know what you're doing or you don't know what the answer is supposed to be and the protocols aren't 100%, it's really hard to get it to work well. It's very difficult. People who work on PCR always have kind of, you know, fetishes, you know, little toys around, little cuddlies that they have, uh, plushes they have around on the, on the lab bench, and they'll do things in a particular order because they've become superstitious. If I do it that way, it will work. If I do it that way, it won't. So these things are really hard. And we know this because um, in, after the fall of Al-Qaeda, uh, the US troops went into Afghanistan and they discovered documents written by the deputy head of Al-Qaeda saying, hmm, the enemy keeps on saying that this genetic engineering is really easy and could be very dangerous if it fell into the hands of the terrorists. We will try it. And they failed. So they, they did actually try, but they, they failed. And, you know, in terms of terrorist threats, well, we've seen uh, in Europe in particular that they can, you know, they're happy, God help us, with, uh, you know, uh, a truck, with knives, with anything that can cause havoc. They don't need, you know, the the cleverness of either a molecular weapon or of you know mass Teslas smashing themselves together on a highway. You know, they, they can do things much more simply if they want. Yeah, I was looking at the cover of your book, you know, with sort of the barcode theme, which suggests something like a a machine, uh, you know, with bits, binary digits. And in a way, I mean, what we've discovered in the last century, I guess, is that we are machines. We, we're made of molecules and atoms, and those are bits and pieces. Mm. So in principle, <laughs> it seems like the simpler version, in principle, we could just program it. Well, but that, yeah, the, that's the, partly what we've done. That's how we make insulin. We have reprogrammed the, the bacterium. Bacterium is just happily sitting there doing its thing, and then suddenly its instructions tell it, I've got to spew out a load of this pro-insulin, and then these humans are going to, grind me up and extract it uh so yes that's there's been this there's all you know this this tension because it's not as simple as saying well we're machines well we are but we're extremely strange machines i mean the heart's a pump but it's not like any pump we have ever built you know so the, these are it's a metaphor you've got to remember it is a metaphor we are not machines we are alive bacteria alive and you can have you know if you've got a whole dna sequence of a back you easily have a you know, whole sequence of a, a microbe but it won't do anything. That DNA is inert. It's not going to do anything. It's just going to sit there. It's got to be in something else that's alive in order to be activated and for the whole thing to start to make, make sense. And even then it may not. Depends on whether it's got the right regulatory mechanism. So one of the things that people are interested in at the moment in is writing genomes, producing completely novel genomes. In microbes, I think, is, is well, it already has been done. People have tried to find, well, what's the minimum number of genes you need to be a microbe? You know, how, how small can you get? How compact can a genome get? And what's fascinating is that sometimes things that they thought were irrelevant turned out to be very important. So, for example, in the latest round that uh, uh, been going through of reducing the number of microbes uh, in one particular that they form, that they study, they found that a number of genes turned out to be important, which control the microbe's shape which they didn't particularly think was relevant, but clearly has got some, I mean, that's, it's going to be there for a reason, you know, but uh, they, they had kind of dismissed it, but the microbes were not happy if you altered their shape or by removing these genes. So we, you can program some things and clearly, you know, a lot of things about us are genetically and then physiologically determined because it's the genes have got to interact with the body have the physiological effects they interact with the outside world um but you know you can what got me into this back in 1976 was reading an article uh about making a fruit fly stupid by changing a single letter of its dna and it couldn't learn so you know that poor old fly had been deprogrammed if you want you know now it couldn't it couldn't in fact it couldn't remember stuff uh and i i remember reading that and thinking, my God, that's astonishing. I want to work in that field. That is absolutely amazing. Che use genetics to understand behavior and something as complicated as learning. So yeah, in, in a way, but, you know, we are okay, not, so, you know, we're alive. So 
So let me just restate it. So you could create an artificial genome, but you have to put it in something. And that's something by which you mean like a cell that has chemical processes that are already yeah. churning away. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the, the, the stuff uh, that's been done so far has done exactly that. You've taken the, the bacterial chromosome out and then put a new bacterial chromosome, which you've entirely synthesized into that cell. But all of the, the chemistry or the biochemistry, the cell wall, everything about that has, was already there. So we, we can't, you know, we're not, we're not creating life. You can't, uh, we still don't know how to do that. We still don't, I mean, at some point, chemistry, biochemistry turned into, well, chemistry turned into biochemistry, and then that turned into, be turned into an organism. We got lots of ideas about that, and there are all sorts of different theories about the processes that were involved and where it happened. Uh, but we can't do that in the lab, and I, I, I suspect it's going to it's going to be a long time before we can. If 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 that's, I mean, I don't think there are very many people. Yeah, there are a few. Uh, that's the pro my my intelligent design creationist uh, friends are fond of pointing this out. You still can't do it. That's why, and well, then that. Yeah, that, that's, when God, that's when that's when God enters the equation. Well, okay, you know, if, <laughs> I have no need for that hypothesis. If it comforts <laughs> right. them, that's fair enough. <laughs> right. Okay. So, but um, uh, let's see, what was I going to ask about? Oh, yeah. So, how would you then define life or a living organism? Oh, and then, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the context of then define for us what a gene what a gene is. Oh, I can't gene is do that either. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I'm not joking. I'm not being obtuse. So this is fascinating. I, I mean, I talk to the, my students about this. So if you talk to philosophers, uh, they are really interested in definitions of life. If you and so are physicists actually, um, if you if you similarly genes, the fact that we got all these different definitions of genes, of species, of life. Um, I'm not particularly bothered about that. I mean, it's a bit like art. Or pornography, guess I, I guess I, I know it when I see it. Uh, I mean, that, I'm being flippant there, but I mean, for example, there's uh, in 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 the NASA have got a definition of life, what they're looking for out in space, and that is a system which is capable of Darwinian evolution. That seems to me not bad. That's not bad at all. Um, it's got to be self-sustaining, so that would exclude, for example, uh, various computer viruses which change and alter and all the rest of it. Uh, it, it would, I mean, there's a big dispute about whether a virus is alive. I tend to think they're not. Um, so it's got to be something that can metabolize. It's got to be able to interact with the outside world, copy itself. And that Darwinian evolution suggests that the copying cannot be perfect. There's got to be mistakes introduced or variation introduced somehow that can then be acted on by the environment, sifting between different variants according to whether they're more successful, whatever that might mean in a particular environment. So I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I think that's a pretty broad definition. Doesn't tie us down to any particular biochemical system. I haven't thought about it hard enough, but maybe you could imagine some electronic version of that. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, but conceivably, yeah, something living in a virtual world uh, that would also show those kind of characteristics. Um, but we're not very good at defining things in, in biology in particular. I mean, it's like, you know, physicists like this. They've got a very precise view. Why is that? Yeah, that's well, interesting. Cause that, because that's hard. Biology's everybody hard. Cites, that's uh, why. What's the, what is life? That was uh, yeah, Schrodinger. Uh, Sch Schrodinger, yeah. Schrodinger. Well, why is he writing a book about life? He's well, a yeah, indeed. Yeah, but he, <laughs> he thought he could do it. He thought it was easy. That's why. And what physicists always, they, they approach it with a particular you know, my, mindset. And then they discover that, in fact, it's horrendously complicated. I mean, what, what Schrodinger said life was localized negative entropy. And I remember talking to Brian Cox, the British physicist, about this. And he said, yeah, that's fantastic. I said, yes, but Brian, uh, a refrigerator is localized negative entropy. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, right. Point. So it's, it's not quite right. that. You know, that, that. It is. That's, <laughs> that's one funny. of the things that life is, but it's not the whole thing. And what you learn very soon as a biologist, in particular when you start in a new part of biology, is, you know, there's this bewildering variety and you try to anchor it and come up with, well, these are the rules. These are the framework. Okay, I understand this species or set of species does this and then this does this. And then you talk to somebody who really knows what they're talking about. Go, oh, yes, of course. But what about X, Y, Z and this strange thing that lives in Panama? And then, okay, actually, I don't understand it at all because 
you know, we don't have laws, right? They're, the only laws that biology has are those of physics that constrain us. Uh, mm -hmm, but, right. you know, whenever you try to find something that is true everywhere, it always turns out not to be. Do you know about this group of uh, transhumanists that call themselves the Extropians? They're against entropy. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're so like am they're I. like the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I'm doing my best. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad idea, but it's going to get us in the end. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. The fr the refrigerator will run down okay. at yeah, some point. I, I don't have a lot of time for transhumanism. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but a gene, in a way, is is a, a sequence of DNA on a particular. A chromosome that does something, right? It, it it produces this protein that causes this to happen. So we're kind of backing into it, like, well, we're looking for the explanation for this effect here. Why is this protein there? Because this sequence of genes produced it, right? And so it's kind of an a, it, it's not a thing that's sitting there doing nothing. It has to do something to be a gene. Yeah, well, it, yeah. I mean, the DNA is uh, is really boring. I mean, it's incredible, but it's also boring. It doesn't do anything. It's it's a library. And it only does something when it interact when the cell makes it, and the cell is making it through other molecules, in particular RNA, which is not its evil twin, but is kind of half of it in a way. You can imagine it being like it's just a single strand, and it, it it's the 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 complementary copy of whatever is on your DNA strand. You can turn into RNA, and many are many DNA genes, many genes don't make proteins; they make RNA that then alters the activity of another gene, so they're regulatory genes. Um, so, but the DNA on its own won't do anything unless you, the cell makes it and the cell is generally making it because of something external to it, either in the environment, if it's a single cellular organism or in our bodies, you know, the cells next door or down the, you know, down the left leg where they are doing something and making a, you know, if you, they're damaged, then they're producing a response up here in your head, which say, oh, that hurts. Um, you know, and the cells are responding to external features. So. It's a very odd kind of machine. I think that's the point. It's a machine that is not simply like a computer, a set of instructions, do this, do that, because it's got this interactive nature at the heart of its very being. You know, that, that's, that's why a piece of DNA on its own is, is nothing. And a cell without the DNA won't be able to do anything. Uh, you need the cell, you need the DNA, you need the, 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 all the biochemistry to enable this library to ter be turned into action. I guess like with your previous book on the brain, we, we depend on these metaphors to try to get our mind around something that may just be a one-off thing that isn't like anything else. Uh, that, I never thought of that before. Uh, that's quite nice, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of life. We can say there's an infinite variety of it on the earth. Whether there's anywhere else, uh, and if it's like us, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, this is the... This is one of the big mysteries. Uh, we have a whole course on this at the University of Manchester because some of my colleagues who uh, are radio astronomers are big into SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And so uh, we teach about the, 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 the physics of it, the biology and the sociology and politics of why we're interested in uh, alien life anyway. But I think that's an interesting point that, yeah, it is, it is so odd that we end up with these metaphors trying to, to frame what's going on. Well, like your your previous discussions of consciousness, explain the hard problem of consciousness. Go on, and then we reach for metaphors to cut. Well, it's like this, it's like that. Maybe it's just a really, really weird thing, and it's not like anything else. Yeah, I mean the same. The same goes for physics, obviously, because they, you know, I mean, we all learned that uh, you know the atom was these set of billiard balls, and that the, the electron is like a a little satellite going round, and then you discover no, it's. I mean, this is just complete rubbish. It's a it's a cloud of potentiality or something like that. I don't know, which is still, I mean, it's not a cloud either. You know, it's a field. Ultimately, it's all fields of, but there's another metaphor, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very hard. Uh, you know, physics and maths can do it because they end up literally using a different language. They, you know, that's why they, they, it's all in symbols and so on, because that is, they're getting to the purest expression of these phenomena. Uh, with biology, you know, you, you, you kind of get up to that realm and then you stop because that's their business, you know, the next stage down. Uh, and we're interested in how all those things are interacting to produce a membrane or uh, a chromosome or a gene or whatever. Um, but it, it, it is very hard when you start thinking in those ways about, about what's going on. Yeah, these definitions, like you mentioned species, 
I had to memorize the definition of, of a species by, from Ernst Mayer when I took uh, <laughs> the intro to evolution. Species is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such populations. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so that's great. But what about a stegosaur? <laughs> you see, that's fantastic. But it, it completely falls down when you start looking at fossils. You've no idea. You end up going back. Oh, well, it's right. got a lump here and a lump there. So it's a different right, species. Right. Yeah. You know, yes. So that's a, that's an example. I teach my students this. I mean, I teach them the biological example. You just the definition yes. you've just given. But I also say this doesn't work for loads of microbes, even a lot of plants and for no any fossil organism. So it's not much use. I was talking to uh, uh, my friend Frank Sullaway about this, uh, who, who knew Ernst, and he's, he's writing a kind of an edited version of the origin of species that uh, Ernst had, had worked on. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we were talking about this, and he started talking about lateral gene transfer. And anyway, there's some of this going on at the Galapagos that uh, had never been recognized. And in Frank's explanation was, every, as long as Ernst Mayer was still alive, he was sort of the grand old man, and no one wanted to change the definition of the species. The only way, you know, is just interbreeding or not interbreeding, that's it. And and now that he's dead, it's okay to think about species in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind well, of a sociology I, I, of science. Yeah, I think that there is, I mean, my, my good friend Jerry Coyne would be the inheritor mm. of uh, of Meyer's uh, definition. Um, but, I mean, they're, they're, none of them, none of them are exact, none of the, I think there are about 18 different, different definitions of species. And they're all looking at different aspects of the same reality. So it is a load of blind people touching an elephant. They're all going to come up with a slightly different aspect. But from my point of view, then Mara was right and the biological definition. That's what I teach my students. But I'm not a paleontologist. If I were, I'd have to go back to lumps and bumps and strain, you know, <laughs> right. decide them. This is that and that's that. <laughs> right. You get kind of a, a fuzzy set. It, it, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's like, it's like these things with these characteristics, right? Okay. Let's talk about some of the ethics and some, some, that the moral history of the genetic age. So um what so do people react differently to say a recombinant let, actually let's let's back up for a second what's the difference between recombinant dna and what people are doing now with genetic engineering or what are the two or three different versions of this well yeah they've the, the point is scientists keep on using new terms uh partly deliberately to avoid the bad connotations of the previous definition that you know the fears that they'd arisen and partly because there's some kind of very subtle technical difference so Recombinant DNA is what it was called in the 1970s. And all that means is you've got DNA from two different sources. So in a way, you and I are both recombinant organisms because we've got a mother and a father, and our DNA is not identical to either of those. It shares elements of both. So what they were able to do, and the great breakthrough done by Paul Berg, was to be able to get DNA from a virus and from a bacterium and to mix them up and to have them in the same organism to use various biochemical tools to transfer them uh, from one organism to another and that is that is qualitatively different from you and me right because it, it is not even from the same species from the same group as the same viruses probably aren't even alive and now they're you're putting this into the micro now we now know that that happens an awful lot and in fact that is the basis that mixture of uh, viral dna and microbial DNA is, in fact, the basis of the modern way of doing uh, what's now called gene editing, because that sounds kind of nice and safe and not at all problematic, uh, called CRISPR, which actually works because, or was discovered because, microbes, we now know, when they're attacked by viruses, uh, if they can beat them off, they snip up the uh, viral DNA and put it into their own DNA as a kind of memory that their descendants will recognize the viral uh, RNA when it comes in, it's being reproduced and trying to get into their DNA, and will then mobilize these molecular scissors to snip it up. So, you know, a lot of bacteria, it turns out, actually are actually recombinant in much the same way as, way as we made in the 1970s. But the, the, the key thing that we now do would be to use this kind of uh, editing technique to use enzymes to target a particular sequence of DNA that you already know, and then to alter it in a particular way. And you do that by actually tricking the cell. You use enzymes to cut the double strand of DNA, and then the cell isn't happy. The cell doesn't like having its DNA snipped up. That's not good. And it will do one of two things. Either it will just try and stick the two bits back together, and that sometimes produces a mutation. It's not good. Unless, of course, you're doing an experiment which you're trying to create a mutation, so that might be quite a bit of fun. That might be what you want in a, a mouse or a fly or something. 
or in the best of circumstances, you can trick the, uh, the organism into using a piece of DNA that you provide as a template to heal the wound, to put in new information. So the cell itself is just reading this stuff and going, okay, it's not actually putting that bit of DNA in, it's copying it and thinking, okay, right, I can use that to, that's clearly what I should have here. Because what it's normally doing is looking on the other chromosome. You've got two pairs of chromosome and it looks across the other chromosome. Okay, that's the sequence there. It hasn't been chopped up. I'll use that to repair this, uh, this uh, damaged part. The, the, the problem is that, uh, that whether that works or not depends on a very subtle set of conditions in the uh, of the cell depending on exactly in what state it is whether it's quiescent or whether it's dividing and that's not the same in every organism so what we've learned over the last because this is a technique that's now been around for nearly 12 years now yeah 12 years in fact this uh probably yeah when you this comes out that will be the 10 10 years rather the anniversary of uh, Dowden and charpentier's paper in december 2012 um in the last 10 years we've learned that this can go wrong. If you try and do this at the wrong point in the cell cycle, the cell will not simply stick that bit of DNA. It can actually start chopping stuff up. And we know, for example, in, in human cells, that if you don't get it right, you can lose whole chromosomes. Huge bits of DNA get kind of hacked up. And so rather than being editing in a pair of scissors, it looks like a chainsaw's gone amok in there. Um, and in terms of you know, editing, not only you know, I mean, your red blood cells, say, if you wanted to cure a genetic disease in the blood, CRISPR, this technique, should enable you to do it very precisely to change even a single letter of DNA. But if the cell's not in the right state, it can produce rather unpleasant consequences. So you want to be sure it's worked. And clearly, if you're editing an embryo, which I don't think you should, but has happened in 2018, uh, then it can produce very alarming so I kind of got, so I got a bit, oh, I went off on one. No, so, sorry. But that, no, that was, that was perfect. Cause you ended right where I wanted to go next. Why, why, why would you be against doing that with an embryo? Well, I mean, in principle, if you got it right and you eliminated whatever the disease would be, that's good. Why, why would I do it? Who, who would need, who would, who needs this? That's the issue. See, this is what nobody asked until after her John Key. Why would you do this? Who needs this? So at the moment, if you have a genetic disease in your family, then uh, in the UK, at least, which has pretty stringent laws on this. Um, in the UK, you can have uh, what's called pre-implantation selection of your, of your embryo. So basically, you have IVF, which I think is worth pausing for a minute and just thinking that that's actually a pretty tough process to go through for a couple, and in particular for the woman. Many of the people who advocate this seem to be men. I haven't heard many women. I mean, I'm not being, I'm not being glib here. This is true. I've heard very few women, especially not women who've been through it, but any listeners who've been through this or whose family have will know that this is no joke. It's a serious step. Anyway, you do the IVF. Let's just say that's that easy. You mix egg and sperm. For the gent, it's quite straightforward. For the lady, it involves harvesting hundreds of eggs, right? So you've got to be full of hormones. You extract the eggs, um, mix egg and sperm, and then you see which of the cells, which of the embryos are viable on which are or which are healthy and which have got the genetic disease and you simply insert implant the ones that are healthy now that is what we do at the moment in the uk for example the only people who could not be helped that way and of course we're not talking about the baby here. we're talking about the parents the baby doesn't exist nobody is cured of a genetic disease by this nobody exists until you do the experiment and then you implant the baby and then it's got to be brought to term but, you know, there is no, there is no, there's no curing. What there is is a selection, right? Um, what the only people who, whose desire for a non-effective biological child of their own who could not be helped by the current techniques are those people who either both have what's called a recessive disease. So you need two copies of the gene to be ill. So if they've both got two copies, then all of their offspring are going to have two copies. There's no way around that. So those people could have a healthy baby using this technique. And the other are people where one or other of the patients has, it has what's called a dominant disease, but has two copies of the, uh, two copies of the affected gene. And that way, all their offspring is going to have one 
and that will be sufficient to make the mill. So Huntington's career, which is a horrible neurodegenerative disease, that, that's an example of that. So, right, how many people, how many couples around the world are there who fall into those two categories? That's actually the question. That's the only reason. You and what are you doing there? You are meeting their desires to have their own biological child. You're not actually curing anybody. So once you've got it clear, how many people will we talk about? We don't know, because it's very hard to know, but the estimates from the people who do genetic counselling in the UK and the US are, are perhaps a few hundred couples around the world. That's it. So right. that's, wow. that is, the, you know, you say, why are we doing this? What is the point? And you know that those few hundred couples are not going to be randomly distributed, or the ones who get access to this technique are not going to be randomly distributed. This is not going to be something that is going to, you know, save everybody or whatever. And you know what? Sometimes you can't have a child. Lots of people are infertile and it's miserable. But, uh, you know, maybe the best thing that they can do, the couples who want to have their own child, is not to use this very dangerous technology because it is incredibly dangerous at the moment and it's not something that should be applied. But, you know, adopt a child. There are plenty of children who are healthy and who aren't healthy who need adoption. Think about that. That And, you know, spend all your money, donate it to Water Aid or some charity that's, you know, I, I saw a figure that, you know, half the, planet doesn't have proper sewage systems that that would save lives you want to save lives fresh water clean water sewage systems not fiddling around with genes here i'll show you something okay this is my wife and son yeah uh he he is an ivf baby okay well so you we know what it's like we, then okay we went through this okay, okay right so, so you know Je jennifer had to get all those shots and, you know, like the needle into the leg. Oh, my God. And I, yeah. of course, I'm just, I just have yeah. to make my country. At some yeah, point, easy. I make my country. <laughs> that's <laughs> okay, the easy right, part. Well, that was, okay. Uh, although, I'll so tell you, know, you, funny, you You get what I'm talking about, yeah? I know I know what you're talking about. Now, so, but, okay, so, yes, we did all that. We got lucky with, the, you know, just implanted yeah. one, and, and it took, and, and so it succeeded. I know other couples, We uh, and, and the guy who did this is a good friend of mine now. And uh, so, you know, uh, most of the couples go through this over and over and over. It's expensive. It's massively uh unpleasant for the women and it's a it's a big thing yeah i mean it's yeah. like a surgery to get the, to retrieve the eggs you know it, you're under and the whole thing it's a major surgery in in a way uh but what if you just did it the old-fashioned way <laughs> and you find out early on that you have trisomy 21 your 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 implanted embryo as it were <laughs> uh you know it's down syndrome is there a way you could go in there and fix that i mean in principle um so, yeah, uh, by removing, re a whole chromosome, removing a whole chromosome i don't know uh i i mean that's i don't know don't think that's ever been done I and mean, we now have we have grimmer ways of dealing with uh this which is actually raises kind of the whole problem of thinking about thinking through the ethics of such things so what's happening all in all over the world is now we can uh identify whether the fetus has uh, got down syndrome by a blood test on the mother because we can detect fetal dna so you can do that, I think, at about two months or something like that. So the possibility of a relatively painless and more or less undistressing, potentially undistressing termination, I'm not making light of this at all, uh, is, is there. And this is happening. So in countries where this has been introduced, in Scandinavia and indeed in the UK now, because of lots of individual choices, individual choices, I'm going to terminate the child. I don't want to have a Down syndrome baby. Um, the number of Down syndrome babies is plummeting. So what we have in terms of a culture of acceptance uh, of the presence of these people in the population, uh, the, you know, the support networks, all that's going to disappear slowly or it's going to become weakened because there'll be fewer of those people about because of not of any eugenics plan, but a whole series of absolutely justifiable and understandable individual choices. And I don't have any answer to this. I just find it yeah. very, it's really hard. But, you know, just, but what we went through, tons of parents do, I mean, tons of couples do. It's not at all unusual, but what, in the 1980s or so, wasn't it, uh, you know, this was playing God. This was yeah, absolutely. Not because... In the 70s, this was when it was first 70s, developed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So this was all mixed up with the development of genetic engineering. People were very excited about the possibility of, of IVF. I mean, it was developed not far from, from where I am in, in, in Manchester. Um, and, uh, Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, right. as she was called, she was born in a test tube. <laughs> she, she wasn't, you know, <laughs> they simply fertilized the egg and then implanted it. 
Uh, but they, you know, they had spent about a decade working on this. It was incredibly slow, long work. But indeed, there was huge hostility. And now it is a perfectly accepted, normal part of reproduction. Uh, some, you know, some people for all sorts of reasons go down that route. Um, you know, I'm, it, and yeah, this is, this is normal now. It's not usual. Most people don't do that, but it's quite normal. Uh, in the UK, the NHS will support this, but you only get, say, three cycles. I've forgotten the figure, but it varies from place to place. But you go get a limited number of free goes, and after that, you have to start paying. But as you, you said, Michael, it, it can take a long time and be very, very hard oh, it's, work. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like tens of thousands of dollars at yeah. d minimum. And I, yeah. I've known people that spent, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars to get, you know, finally get. Yeah. That's a lot when you could adopt. Uh, and so there is something about it's my DNA. It's my half my DNA. Yeah. There's something I don't know what it is instinctively or intuitively. No, I, 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 I get that. I get that. All, all I was trying to do earlier on when talking about the people with the, I mean, these what would be a handful of effectively a, a few hundred couples, if they were wishing to do that, uh, you know. It seems to me that that is not, given the dangers, that is not something that we should be uh, accepting as a as a global society. But at the moment, there's no way of stopping it happening. And this is one reason. So after He Jiankui did this terrible experiment, which went horribly wrong uh, in China in 2018, and three baby girls have been born. We don't know how well they are, which is fine. I mean, it's fine that I don't know, because I don't think the girls should be a circus. You know, and the Chinese state being very secretive anyway is not giving updates on their health but i hope people are looking after them and if there's the slightest indication that they're not well that they will get the best free possible health care they can get in china um but uh come remember yeah so the um what was i said i well i've now well, completely lost gonna, my train was, of thought <laughs> i was gonna add i i met that woman louise brown she oh, was right, uh, yeah she was a speaker at a conference that my ivf doc richard paulson who's now a good friend i mentioned he was head of this ivf I forget what the name of the organization is, but it's all the doctors who work on this. It's a huge auditorium. It's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people just in like Southern California, that, or maybe United States or whatever. Uh, so, and, and, and it was kind of a, uh, you know, bringing her there, it was like, look how things used to be. Now, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're all just doing this, you know, it's like our job. It's like a full-time job. And, uh, you know, that's those shifting norms. So what- Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this, it, 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 yeah. Things do change. They're not, they're not absolute. Like with the the issue of uh, the issue of Down syndrome, so I I I'm not I mean between you and me and how many tens of thousands of listeners <laughs> you have, uh, the moral history uh, it's not my subtitle, that's the U.S. Publishers. Oh, I see, I see. We did we did have a I slight see. dispute over that. I don't I'm sure they won't mind, but maybe I mean no, I didn't like the title either. But as you said, that works great in the the, the as gods is better in the U.S. Um, but, so but they, the, they, maybe uh, they but... know their market. But but the, some of the technical legal moral issues like the patenting of a life form, you have that quote from Jonas Salk, you know, about patenting the polio vaccine. Well, you, would you patent the sun? You know that. But you, 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 here you're just counting on some guy who's nice about it and doesn't want to make, you know, a billion dollars. But yeah. plenty of other scientists are like, yeah, I'd like to do science and I wouldn't mind being a billionaire, too. So, hey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, 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 that's what I was getting at in, in the U.S., there's there's no barrier to you to this happening. So in in many countries there is a law there are laws against genetically manipulating embryos, but in the U.S. there is no. The only laws there are the restrictions are not using federal funds or facilities, and that's because of all the business about stem cells and the sanctity of the embryo and all the rest of it. Uh, from the, your culture wars from the nineties, that's the, the 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 continuation of that. But if you have sufficient funds and equipment you can buy with those funds and people you can buy, then you can do this in the USA. There's nothing to stop you. Um, and that's one of the issues that when the, the, the He Jong Kui scandal erupted, there was calls uh, about a month later for a moratorium on genetic and engineering, heritable genetic engineering, not genetic engineering of uh, our blood cells, say, which is is going to produce fantastic cures and, and experimentally is doing so, has done so. You know, people have been cured of things like sickle cell disease using genetic engineering of their red blood cells, changes that will not be passed to the next generation. So that is fantastic. And there are real possibilities for me biomedicine uh, in the future. But for manipulating the genes of the next generation, 
which is what her John Cree did. So you change every cell. Oh, he didn't. But you're supposed to change every cell in the embryo so it's the same in your new version. Um, that that is something that is, you know, I I think is is very very problematic. There are calls for a moratorium, and very strikingly, uh, you know, many of the great and the good signed this call. Uh, and for example, Emmanuel Charpentier, who co-invented uh, CRISPR, she signed it. But Jennifer Doudna, the American part of the duo. She didn't. She said, look, this is, yeah, it's, it's just too late. We can't stop this. Um, you know, if we try and you know, legislate morally against it, which is what a moratorium is, uh, then people will go underground and hide. I and mean, it's better if we know what's going on. So people are divided on this. There's, there's no unanimity, unlike in a cinema or unlike in the arguments there were over gain of function. Uh, research in 2011, 2012, which again, there was a research pause because people had done what they described as really stupid things and made some of these viruses incredibly dangerous. And they said, OK, we're going to have to work out new biosecurity protocols before we proceed. But they didn't ever say, should we be doing that? And that's a bit of the difference with this current debate about human genetic engineering. All the future discussions that are going to be coming up in the next few years over uh, genome writing that I know that the people who are involved in those technical discussions, how can we do this and how can we make money out of it, are also very keen to have ethical considerations built into the debate from the very outset. And that, I think, is the, that's what we've got to realise, that these things, you can't push them to one side. You know, a cinema, they didn't discuss bioweapons, they didn't discuss human genetics, and they didn't discuss environmental change. And those things which they didn't want to talk about we're already there in, in embryo and in reality, in the case of bioweapons. And now they are here with us. And we've got to, we, you know, if we'd been really thinking about this for the last half century, we might be a bit better equipped to have a, a more uni, unanim, unanimous view on, on what to do. Yeah, you quote uh, my friend Steve Pinker in your book about, uh, you know, basically upbraiding uh, et biological ethicists, get out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> and just let us do our thing. And then if there's a problem, we'll deal with it later. Is there a case to be made for the precautionary principle? We should uh, nip it early just in case? Well, I think so. I mean, it, it, during the debates around Asilomar, Sidney Brenner, the, the great uh, South African, UK based, South African geneticist who was based in the UK, um, he's, he gave evidence to the Houses of Parliament or something. I can't remember. He was also one of the key motor forces at the Asilomar meeting. And he said, well, yeah, it's a, you know, what we're worried about is an accident. But unlike, say, a road accident, you know, those kind of accidents don't tend to be self-replicating. And I think that's, that's the point. And that's, that's why Pinker was wrong and was glib uh, about talking about human genome editing. I don't think you get out of the way. I think you need, the ethicists need to be, you know, very concerned about it. I mean, very strikingly, many of the ethicists have actually been you know, I think quite crass because they've been kind of hopeless utilitarians who said, well, yes, it's our destiny to, I don't know, go and live on. You know, the latest thing is we're all going to go and live on Mars, work for a certain person <laughs> in his slave camps, you know, trying to pay off the, the, the trip that he's given us for free. And then we've got to work as indentured labor on Mars with our genes, you know, crispered. I mean, this is all a fantasy. It's a horrifying fantasy, but it's a fantasy. Um, and the reality is that these things are amazingly complicated. Let, let's just go back to the blue-eyed baby. Let's say, let's say you decided that when you were making your, your lovely boy, you wanted him to have blue eyes. Maybe he has got blue eyes. <laughs> uh, You're not supposed to have to look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> yes, um, okay. Yeah, but if you wanted to have a blue-eyed baby, let's say you're, you know, you're a real card-carrying Nazi and you said, okay, I've got to have a blue-eyed baby. Um, and we're going to do this. Well... The problem there is that we now know that, I mean, at school we learn that, well, blue's recessive to brown and there are these two genes and all the rest of it. And, you know, all the kids who've got uh, brown eyes but have blue-eyed parents start to think, well, wait a minute, something bad has happened there. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not, in fact, true. So there are mm. over 60 genes involved in eye colour. And more or less, whatever colour your parents' eyes are, it is technically possible to have any colour offspring. So uh, if you really wanted, you know, if you really were a mad Nazi who really had to have a blue eyed baby, you'd have to edit 60 genes. I, I mean, that's just not happening. Yeah, it's just not, yeah. not, not, not feasible. And that's Even something relatively a, simple. 
Yeah, absolutely. Something which is you know just a color, just a pigmentation that's being produced. So never mind if you have dreams about you know producing an intelligent child or whatever. You know, give your right. child books to read. Right. You know, take that screen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and height that. is height. Height's similar to that, right? It seems yeah. like it's a pretty obvious genetic thing, but there's just like hundreds oh, it's of genes, m masses of right. genes. Yeah. And again, yeah. you know, what if you go to any of your listeners go to a European castle, you'll see suits of armor, mm. and those suits <laughs> of armor are all for kind <laughs> of wee guys, you know, who are about five foot five. Yeah. What right. happened? Is it the genes? No, they just ate crap food. You go to Holland right. and you're surrounded by giants. They could have a fantastic basketball team. And that's mainly because <laughs> of the food. I mean, there are genetic right. components in it. But as you say, there are hundreds and hundreds of genes, each of which is having a tiny effect. And to be confident uh, of producing an offspring like that would be really, really hard. Right. So um, I like the example of the silver foxes by that Russian scientist whose yeah. name I always forget. Uh, you know, breeding for timidity so they can approach the fox easier so, and, and so on. But they ended up with the floppy ears and the little star-shaped fur and a curly tail. And so this is pleiotropy, right? You, you select for one set of genes, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't get genes for, right? There's not a right. gene yeah. for. Genes do stuff. They do all sorts of stuff. And that will change over time. It will change depend on what other genes there are in the genome, which is different between all of us. You know, there is no human genome. There are human genomes and we're all different, you know? Uh, so yeah, the, the, the fox is a fantastic example. I mean, basically they, they evolved dogs, you know, right, right. I mean, although dogs don't come from foxes, they come from wolves or they are wolves, but they, they ended up by choosing these characters. They ended up with all this other stuff. Uh, that came with it. And I mean, you can buy these these foxes. They look absolutely charming. They must be uh, very nice. They're very expensive. Oh, I didn't know you could buy them. That's yeah. interesting. There's a there's fantastic, a, book, there's a fantastic book by, I've forgotten. What's it called? Oh, uh, yes. By a historian of science, I think, uh, wrote yeah, that book. Yeah, on and one of the Russians who's still involved in the project. It, it, it is right. brilliant. I've right. forgotten what it is, folks, but if you Google it, you'll find it. But this would be the argument against selective breeding or genetic engineering for a certain set of characteristics like blonde hair, blue eyed, whatever. It's just not that simple. And not only is it not that simple, you're going to get a bunch of other stuff yeah, that you absolutely. probably don't want. Yeah. And so if anything, a diverse, genetically diverse population is probably better for a nation or a society because of the ever-changing environment. So let's touch on epigenetics um, because, you know, Jerry, you mentioned Jerry Coyne. He's my go-to guy for debunking all the claims made about epigenetics. You know, like we can change the world. I can change my genes through meditation. No, you can't. Okay. But, but I know he's kind of on the far end of being very yeah. critical of epigenetics. And, and I don't, how do you think about epigenetics? Um, well, uh, well, epigenetics is real. That is what basically yeah, what yeah. it is. It's gene regulation. I mean, they give it this sexy name. So it's really exciting, epigenetics. But if you said gene regulation, then people go, oh, that doesn't sound much fun. But I mean, that's the essence of how your genes are responding differently at different times and in different environmental conditions. And basically, it's it's not so much like a switch. It's like a kind of, or a, it's a mixture between a switch and an amplifier button that actually gets, these are chemical tags that get put on the outside of the chromosome, which either uh, allow, encourage the gene to be expressed or can stop it being expressed under certain conditions. And I mean, that is happening in all our cells all the time. So that's very, very real. The issue is what happens when you make a baby? Are those tags preserved? Do they get passed on? So this is the, the idea that trauma, hunger, in the case of the Dutch hunger winter after the Second World War, when people were severely uh, mal severe malnutrition and their offspring are also, it's supposedly uh, slightly odd, uh, in various ways, they have various problems, that these, these tags are passed on. And so that there's a possibility of a, uh, a kind of memory going down the generations, an adaptation that isn't genetic, but is a response to the environment and can be transmitted. Now, this does happen, for example, in C. elegans, worms, you can get these kind of changes uh, down the ages. And secondly, um, I remember when I was an undergraduate, as a, and the, as a study I was really impressed by that if you deprive rats, they live in a really miserable cage with nothing to play with and, you know, just nothing in there. They start to, the, the pups will start to show rather odd behavior. 
And there, even if you then put those pups into a healthy environment, then their offspring will show weird behavior and so will theirs. And so this is kind of alarming from if, it, if humans were rats, we're not, then that would suggest that, you know, it's not just cycles of deprivation, but that it's kind of a linear thing. And if you have a deprived family, then that will kind of echo down the generations. Now, in humans, that, that transmission of those tags does not happen. We know this. It, I mean, it literally does not happen. When the egg and the sperm fuse, then all of the DNA is reset to zero. All the tags are stripped off and you start again. But you're not just your DNA. You are in a cell. You're in your mother's cell. And in your mother's cell, that cell was determined before she was born. This is one of the weirdest facts of human reproductive physiology is that girls, or the, the female fetus, it divides all, all its cells that it's ever going to produce. So all the cells, all the, all the eggs that a woman ever produces uh, while she's menstruating throughout her menstrual life are determined before she is even born, when she's still in the uterus. So you can easily imagine either uh, conditions of uh, you know, harsh conditions that the mother was, sub the, a woman was uh, experiencing, it's saying, in Holland in 1947, would actually alter the physiological state of her body and thereby also the cells that are going to be her offspring. And you don't need to then introduce any kind of weird epigenetic transmission, but simply epigenetics. It's simply gene regulation in response to particular environmental conditions. So in humans, this doesn't work. In some systems, it does, like C. elegans, and people use it in all sorts of funky ways. Interesting. And it's quite cool. But yeah, life is infinitely variable. F further complicating the nature-nurture debate to that end, let me review the three laws of behavior genetics and get your comments about why people get freaked out about these. One, all human behavioral traits are heritable. Two, the effect of being raised in the same family is smaller than the effect of the genes. And three, a substantial proportion of the variation in complex human behavioral traits is not accounted for by the effects of genes or families. So what would that be? Luck, chance, randomness? Well, that's the yeah, it's the missing heritability. People get very excited about this. I can't remember where the debate is on that, uh, to be honest. Um, despite my PhD being in behavior genetics, uh, it was uh, in a rather simpler version because I was studying Drosophila. And so we were in, I was interested in mutations. And this is what I was talking about, uh, you know, the idea of being able to change genes and discover effects on learning. That's what I was interested in doing, single mutations. So the, the issue here is that these words sound kind of scary. So all characters are heritable. That doesn't mean to say that they are inherited and that the way they are is immediately passed down. It means that there is a genetic component, component, so that can be the tiniest conceivable component to being 100% genetically determined. And normally it's way, way down at the tiny end to everything that we do because you know, we've got 20,000 genes and not all of them, 20,000 protein encoding genes. And then there's going to be others that are maybe doing RNA regulation and so on. So with 20,000 protein encoding genes, many of them can produce more than one protein. They've got kind of funky ways of uh, reading half the message or whatever uh, and turning that into a different kind of protein. But you still haven't got bazillions of different proteins floating around. So your genes are it's how they are turned on and off which is makes us us and so that too is part of the genetic component it may not be that there's a direct genetic component to a particular particular character but rather the way that the pro where and when the protein is expressed is partly has got a genetic aspect to it so i think that i think it's a it, it sounds um it sounds worrying and as though we are merely uh you know, the, the, we, we're merely puppets of our DNA, if you say, you know, all characters are heritable. But all that really means is that you can, there is variability, because to have heritability, it's got to be variable. There's variability, so it's not all the same. And that if you do an experiment, you can see a particular proportion of that character, whatever it might be, has got a genetic component, which might be really, really tiny. Mm, right. So even identical twins raised in the same home... Uh, it, even when the parents encourage them, they dress them the same and they give them the same hobbies and so on and so forth. They're not identical. No, so, of course they're not. I right, mean, so, I, I worked with twins for three years. I got twins drunk 
Uh, after working <laughs> on did. flies, I got twins, three, twins drunk for three years to see the effects of alcohol, uh, to see the effects of genes and environment on which was the stronger on alcohol. The take home message, it's all noise. Uh, but really? uh, seriously, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this was in a, this was in a controlled population of men. So we took one sex, we took, they were all uh, Caucasian men, you know, white men in, in the UK. So it was very limited. We deliberately avoided uh, introducing broader genetic differences. But yeah, there are physiological responses to alcohol. So how quickly you get drunk, how woozy you feel, right. and the rest of it. It's, it's all noise and changes from time to time, as we all know. Anyway, yeah, so the twins, you, sometimes they'd come in and, because they, they came in separately, and you'd think, wait a minute, you're the same guy, you've come back. Because they tell us things like, oh, I took my brother's driving test, because they got drunk. So they tell us all these secrets about their home lives and you know, doing exams for each other and stuff like that when they, you know, they look safe. But they, they, we always worked out in the end, they weren't identical. And they don't even have the same DNA. They do at the beginning. But because our cells get mutated as they grow, we make mistakes. And that's partly eventually what can cause cancer. You get changes, genetic changes. Uh, those twins are not identical. You know, in the same way as not every, although your, all of your cells should have the same genome, they don't because mistakes happen. Most of them don't matter. But, you know, as the cells are divided, things get wrong and slight, slight mutations are introduced. You get X-ray, you get you know, it's called sun rays, UV is going to mutate skin cells and whatever. So you're not exactly the same. And twins aren't, identical twins are not identical. Um, they are eerily similar i put it that way sometimes and sometimes they're not sometimes you think are you really identical twins i mean this doesn't look like it at all yeah nancy siegel writes books about these and how the similarities are eerie uh although it's in a strange way like like there was two twins that liked the same toothpaste but it wasn't like crest or something it was like that that like this yeah. weird swedish toothpaste or something and they wore rubber bands snapped rubber bands on their wrist and giggled in the same way and and so on. So there can't be a gene or even set of genes for like, I like black shirts or <laughs> these kind of dresses or something. But, you know, her point is that, well, but if you have a certain body type and your twin has pretty much the same body type, you, you're going to select clothes that look good on you and you're more likely to select some similar clothes. And then there's a selection bias for noticing the, the yeah, ones Yeah, we notice. Exactly. I mean, that it's like any coincidence. You know, it's like when you get the ad on Facebook for a lawnmower when you were saying two days earlier, right, I right. haven't got a lawn where well, I wish I had a lawn. <laughs> you know, and it, you think the, the damn, you know, he's listening right. to me. I mean, he's not, right. it's, you know, it's just a right. coincidence. So we know, but yeah. there are lots of eerie examples like that, which advocates of uh, genetic determinism get very excited about. And they're very yes. seductive because you're reading them. Like, God, that's weird. I mean, you'd have to be yes. strange not yes. to, you know, it's very hard right. to find the, the, the rational solution to some of these, uh, yeah. some of these examples. Well, I mentioned Frank Sullivan earlier, and he wrote that book, Born to Rebel, about the non-shared home environment and the competition between siblings to be different from mm -hmm. one another for competition, parental resources and love and attention and so forth. And that, you know, it could be these identical twins in the same environment are actually trying to be different, to carve out a little niche yeah. that separates them from the other. I, right. I guess, and, I mean, again, that would change also depending on what your parents are like, you know, whether you've got to compete, they might be love bombing you and be a real pain and you'd rather be similar. So in your little weird world and get away from these, uh, you know, over loving parents. I mean, families are very strange things uh, and people yes. react to them in all sorts of ways. But I was thinking about that in the context of the, uh, the Boys of Brazil film you mentioned oh, yeah. in your book. You know, the, the evil Dr. Mengele is going to recreate Hitler with this little boy because we got his genes or whatever it was. I forget yeah, now. That was uh, and. And then, then, then they had to like create the same home environment, right? So Hitler's father left when he was five or whatever. So they have a, the boy has a father until he's five. Then they take the father a, away, and he's raised by this whatever it was. I forget, but but that would be impossible. I mean, not even yeah. remotely could you re recreate the same environment. I mean, there's you know a hundred trillion little bifurcations every day that you, you yeah. go left instead of right. You meet this person instead of that person. You eat that food instead of that. Impossible. Yeah. And I mean, cloning, uh, I mean, cloning is very odd. You know, people, uh, it hasn't really worked. So if you think of yeah, all the excitement of Dolly the Sheep, there's been no human clones have been created as far as we know. Um, Dolly the Sheep was a big thing. She was supposed to produce all sorts of weird uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, it didn't work. 
Um, people have cloned horse, race horses, but race horses, you know, they're, it's, it, there's a bit of magic in it, and that hasn't really worked either. Um, so, uh, you know, Barbara Streisand has cloned her dogs. Yes, uh, right. I, I don't think they've got the same coat color because, in, in, in particular, in cats, there's a huge random element to coat color, which means that you, mm. you've got a giant, genetically identical animal, but it doesn't look the same. Um, plus, it's not going to have had the same mother. I mean, you know, you're not just DNA. You've, you've, you've bathed in your, in your mother's, mother's uterine fluid and you've been, you know, hearing a voice and everything like that. You know, when you were in, in the womb, even if you're a kitten, you know, there's, you've had a whole set of experiences indirectly. Uh, and that's going to change those. Your genes will be regulating slightly differently in response to that. Right. It's a little bit like the, uh, again, the transhumanist with the, you know, copy your connectome of your brain, every single synaptic oh, connection. <laughs> uh, and then, and then we put it in a clone of your body and you can continue living. But the moment you split the, the copy, it's not you anymore. They're going to have a slightly different experience, you know, bifurcation every second and you do something different. Yeah. And just, yeah, it's we, nice. we, I mean, I mean, these are, this is great for fiction, right? I mean, don't get yes, me wrong. It's yeah. fantastic. I've read some great <laughs> yeah. books along those lines about you're uploading your brain and the cloneness and uh, but when I'm re rereading it for the hundredth time, maybe uh, one of my favorite books which is called The Goblin Reservation by Clifford D. Simak, um, which is set in, in fact, it made me wanted to be an academic set in a far future in which you've got kind of planetary universities uh, in which they study things like time and well, goblins and uh, they have dragons and all sorts. So, uh, what the starting point of this is that somebody goes through a kind of Star Trek transmatter system and there end up with two of them, one of whom dies. It's no spoiler, it's on the first page. Uh, one of whom is dead, <laughs> and who we don't know anything about. And the other guy says, well, you know, so who died? Was it me or my copy? And, and yeah, that, you, well, it wasn't him. It was something else. But, I mean, they make for great stories, but it's all nonsense. Right. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to just redefine the definition of self. You know, <laughs> well, it's just multiple copies of me. Well, that, what does that word even mean? Yeah. You know, myself. It. And there are people who argue that even the self is an illusion, as you know, that it, you're not, you, you're different from one second to the next. It's just your, you know, through your eyes, point of view self that's always changing. There's no copy of you that would say, well, that's me. Well, you do have some consistencies, don't you? I mean, yes, you know, yes, we, yes. I mean, that's what, what a personality is. That's how animals can have personalities, right, is consistent right. response. And, you know, sadly, in some respects, we, certainly in my case, I tend to do some of the same Make the same mistakes that I've made over and over again uh, without necessarily learning from them. Um, and there are other things that I have been able to sort out about the way I am. So there are, there are aspects of us that are kind of constant. That's how, yeah, I think, it's, I think of it as a fuzzy set or like a channel that you go through with the, the walls are here and you can kind of move around within the walls, but there's going to be a certain consistency there yeah. if you're high in openness to experience and, and, uh, and, and let's say low in neuroticism. You're probably going to be like that for most of your lifespan, more or less. Yeah. The environment can tweak it a little bit. But if you, again, if you're back to the boys of Brazil, you want to create an autocrat. Well, okay, we got to have somebody who's a psychopath, he's a narcissist, uh, and a Machiavellian, you know, the, the, the dark triad, yeah. right? But even that, you know, there'd be like a gazillion factors that go into making a psychopath. Well, or plus, a you know, they would also have to do that to the other kind of 30 million people who were in Germany. Uh, right after the, the First time. World War and who right. were ripe for that kind of uh, situation. So, you know, I mean, you could have a crazed Hitler, but, I mean, he'd end up uh, uh, like Alex Jones or somebody. I mean, you wouldn't, you know, just be a, a ranting <laughs> right. madman on, on the internet. You wouldn't be able to actually <laughs> right. end up, you know, causing the Holocaust, I'm glad to say. Or he could have gotten into that Vienna School of Arts and become a painter. And, uh, maybe and he, he and would Churchill. have been a great painter, yeah. They could <laughs> have been good friends. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, there's the science fiction book, the alternative right. reality book. You can write. A nice one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, this kind of fear of behavior genetics, I'm sure you've given this a lot of thought. Let me just give four little uh, examples from uh, Steve Pinker's book, The, uh, the, the Blank Slate. The, just his ideas of why people fear this. One, the fear of inequality. You know, if we're all the same, then no one can be smarter than anybody else or braver or harder working or anything. The fear of imperfectibility, if, if it's not a blank slate, then, then we can't perfect society and so on uh, and engineer a society to make it better. Three, the fear of determinism, if it's all in my genes and how do you hold people accountable for their behaviors? And then four, the fear of nihilism, you know, if there's no ghost in the machine, if it's just a machine, then what's the purpose and meaning of life? It has no kind of an existential argument, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. So anyway, give me your just give me your thoughts on on that. 
Um, well, I'm not sure. What well, in terms of whether Pink is right about that? Those are the well, reasons. Well, no, just or... more more of the why people fear this idea of genetics having an influence on our our behavior. Well, in in one way, they're we're, they're very keen that they do, and they want their children to be like them or whatever. So That's a good point. I, I think yes. it's we're pretty That's contradictory, in fact. Um, and we think of our own childhoods in ways that that might have been disappointing or frustrated or whatever, and then you try and provide your children with that, with that those tennis lessons I never went to. You've got to be my t- the <laughs> tennis player, you know, whatever. That might be fantastic. The child might be awful. Um, but you so and that's a mixture of genes and environment. You want them to. I mean, you know, clearly people do have uh, disabled children, or they have children who have Down syndrome, which are can be. I mean. Down syndrome is genetically determined. There's no, there's no way around that. That is the way it is. Now, the extent to which you are disabled uh, in with that condition will vary for all sorts of reasons. But basically, you know, if you've got that extra chromosome, then you're in trouble. Um, and we accept that, and we understand that. I th- and that's clearly a different kind of determinism to the kind of uh, all characters are heritable that we were talking about earlier on. So there's one is absolute. It really is determined. The other is a tendency and is a predisposition, which might be quite to a particular behavior or whatever, which might be quite weak. Um, I think the, I, I'm not, I'm not quite so um, sold on the, 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 the moral arguments as they as being important in people's, um, in people's motivation. I think that, I think they're true. I they they raise a contradiction, um, you know. If 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 you have no, ultimately goes back to free will. If you have no free will, then why would you be punished? If you you couldn't do any differently, or I I I had effectively, you know, I'm I am merely the product of all the calculations that are going on in my brain and my physiological processes in my body. Then why should I be punished for that? Um, I mean, that's a, a very pure kind of argument, which uh, doesn't don't think convince many people and I'm, I don't think it worries them. On the other hand, this is a serious argument that is a good philosophical debate uh, to be had. So I, I think the primary reason, I think there's a lot to do with inequality and to do with the way that these things are often used by people in order to buttress their own prejudices. In other words, in particular uh, now about race, but you know, you can you don't have to think about very long to think about attitudes towards women. And that was seen to be an inherent part of the female condition was, you know, not just trivial things about not being able to read maps or whatever, but you cannot have a bank account. You cannot own property. You cannot vote. And those things were seen as being, wasn't put that way, but they were determined. They were genetically determined. And I think people are right to be concerned about the way that the kind of tendency or predisposition gets turned into a, a, a destiny in arguments over race and IQ or, you know, any genetic, any factor linked to, uh, in particular, race, where we, we get very, you know, as a world, we have got very focused in the last few hundred years on skin colour. Uh, and yet, you know, the actual genetic differences between those groups are absolutely immense. Um, and I think in particular, the people who tend to advocate the stronger version of these arguments are also those who are in the positions of power. So they tend to be white men. So, I mean, you don't have to be, you don't have to be ultra woke to think, well, wait a minute, you know, as a, as a black woman, where am I in this? Why, you know? Uh, so, I mean, that doesn't mean to say you don't get very determinist and uh, very racial views amongst certain uh, among certain groups and certain political organizations composed of different ethnic groups and, and, and sexes. But, um, you know, the, the history of the 20th century in particular uh, on, you, on eugenics, which is where this can end up, it doesn't have to by any means, uh, is not good. Um, and yeah, well, I, well, you know, I'd, I'd, right. recommend to no. your, I'd recommend to your listeners another book, Alan Ruther- Adam Rutherford's new book, Control. Uh, which is a history of genetics mm. uh, has Ooh, just come out in the US, yeah, mm. um, and that goes through, and you know that that the the application of that with regard to things like uh, you know mental illness, disability in the USA led to sterilization of you know thousands of women 
And the USA and, and Sweden were the two places that eugenics as a policy where genetic, you know, these characters are genetically determined for the good of either the, the, in, the potential children they may have or of the species, uh, the race, the nation. We need to stop these people breeding. And, you know, so I could, I think that that's the reality. That's where those, uh, an emphasis on those arguments has taken us. So I, I don't think that's uh, simply said, I don't think you can get out of that by saying, oh, well, that's the slippery slope argument. You know, we up here uh, don't, we don't hold with any of that. Sure you don't, but you can see why people might be suspicious. Yeah, well, pre-World War II, eugenics, well, say in the 1910s and 20s, was largely a, a liberal cause. Absolutely, they, you know, we're gonna, yeah. We're going to re-engineer society, yeah. not only socially, politically, and economically, but genetically. Yeah, absolutely. So it wasn't, I mean, it, was, it, it got turned into its vilest form in, in the Holocaust, where it was you know, primarily exterminating people rather than allowing certain particular individuals to breed. But even the, um, you know, the, the essence of, the, uh, of the, the, the liberal approach to eugenics was that the lower classes were inherently quite obviously inferior because they have the lower classes. So that must That's be, right, right. you know, this is the argument that it's uh, survival of the fittest. We are the fittest. Therefore you, you know, you should not survive. That was, you know, the, this is, uh, this came from the 19th century version, a social Darwinist uh, approach. And their idea was therefore you should restrict the, um, the, uh, the breeding of the, the population. So in the UK, uh, one of our most famous advocates of, uh, female con of use of contraception was also uh, she, she wanted to apply it because she wanted to, the lower classes to stop breeding and she did indeed in the end by the 30s she was writing letters to Nazis my university used to be very proud of her because she was one of our first female graduates I have a medal in her name um, wow. for good teaching but then they kind of realized <laughs> that maybe this was uh -huh. a bit of a problem so we've uh, <laughs> right she's been uh, airbrushed out of history that's <laughs> right Yes, you know, Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator, yeah, he had absolutely. a whole, not only was he friendly to the Nazis, turns out, uh, it, like in the late 90s or early 2000s, it was discovered he had a whole family in Germany, a wife, kid, kids that no one knew about wow. in America. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, Even his doing, biographer. Spreading the genes, that's where you're on the, you know, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the exactly, master race. Right. <laughs> hmm. Last, if, speaking of Germany, my, uh, my, my wife's from Cologne, so we were there last week, and so uh, it, it, Cologne's a pretty liberal, you know, metropolitan. It's very diverse city. And anyway, so we took an Uber ride, and I'm chatting it up with the the Uber driver. Had an accent. Where are you from? Syria. And he was a young man, maybe in his late twenties. I thought, oh, I wonder if he was one of the Syrian refugees when Angela Merkel oh, yeah, opened yeah. up the borders. Sure enough, he was. And I thought, oh, this is great. And so he was telling us his horror story of getting here. You know, this boat built for yeah. 20 people and there's 100 people on the boat and they're trying to cross the Mediterranean, on and on. And I was like, you know, I really felt sorry for this guy. Then we got to talking about uh, Cologne being kind of a, it's sort of the gay capital of Europe. And he's like, oh, well, you know, that this is a problem. I'm like, okay, here we go. Because, <laughs> you know, he's Muslim, right? So, and he's like, yeah, no, we can't have that because it's sort of this kind of slippery slope. If everybody is gay, then there'll be no future of humanity. <laughs> so we have to put a stop to this right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife says, uh, so you mean you're, you're feeling like you might be gay. You might become gay. Well, no, 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 no not, not me, not me. No, no, no. <laughs> and then my wife says, well, then get started, buddy. Get, you know, start making some babies if you're worried about the extinction of humanity. And then he said, then he says, well, I don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> And I thought, oh, oh that's a shock. That's a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> yeah, anyway. Okay, let's wrap this thing up uh, uh, using Gattaca as an example. In the future, I mean, uh, oh, parenthetically, by the way, on this, why movies and, and, and novels about mad, crazy scientists doing horrible things, Frankenstein all the way up, maybe it's because you can't write a story that would ever sell that, you know, scientists are doing all these wonderful good things and they've slowly but gradually eliminated disease and things, life became gradually better. There's well, no plot there. There's no story. Well, have you ever seen Star Trek? <laughs> well, that's true, but there's always one, one bad thing that happens. That well, they, it, it they've kinda... always got to go out and they meet the other. I mean, that's the point. Right. Yeah. But I mean, right. yeah. yeah. Um, or you think of uh, Ian M. Banks' science fiction 
stories which are set in a post scarcity okay. universe where people can oh, yes, fix their right. genes okay. but again they're always right. dealing, you know, they've always got to meet some pesky aliens or their right. their ultra intelligent spaceships do the same thing you know so but there are that such stories but you're right that is rather dull i mean right. Karl marx said that you know socialism would be uh, eating foie gras and uh, and listening <laughs> right. to opera um <laughs> right. i mean okay but i mean there's there's not much plot there Carl. <laughs> no that's right <laughs> yes Come the revolution, we'll all get strawberries and cream. And yeah. but I don't like strawberries and cream. Come the revolution, you <laughs> will like strawberries and cream. Right? <laughs> yeah. But so uh, the you know what's the way forward? Century from now, w will we be able to do these kinds of things without all the bad stuff happening, elimination of diseases and things like that? Well, as I say, I don't. I I think the way you deal with uh, genetic diseases that are not treatable in the tissue in the in the in the in the in the adult or the child uh is by eliminating is preventing the fetus uh being implanted i think that's going to be the best way and hopefully we'll find kinder ways of uh getting those eggs of harvesting those eggs mm. well no i mean something like my like personalized medicine so now i have yeah. my genome you sequence it, I get a, a brain tumor, and they go, okay, so this is the exact thing we're going to inject in there. Yeah. Like what Jimmy Carter had, right? They yeah. injected a virus into a tumor, yeah. and somehow the virus knows how to turn the cancer cells off. Yeah, so the virus has basically got a payload, and that payload is a particular gene which will alter the activity of the gene that is altered in his version of cancer. So, yeah, this personalized medicine is our genome, but at the moment, much more significantly, is the genomes of our cancers, which are all going to be slightly different. I mean, some of those will be determined by our genes. So the BCRA1 uh, gene, which is a predisposition to a certain form of breast cancer, uh, people who have that gene will have a certain kind of cancer doing certain things in, in, in their breast. And that's one reason why some women opt to have uh, elective mastectomies preemptively to stop it ever developing. Um, but... For you know, every day other kinds of cancers, then we are now being able to group them to identify them in particular ways through the genes that have mutated and what is producing the cancer, and then target those genes or other genes that can affect them. I mean, it's it's complicated business, um, and that is that is coming on stream for certain kinds of cancer, and I, I expect that that will become widespread. Equally, we now know that uh, not all drugs affect everybody the same way which is not exactly rocket you know, it's not news but it is rocket science it's very hard to work out how and one of the ways is that the drugs are interacting in different ways with our genome so by knowing your precise genome you will be able to have a uh, a precisely dosed or a better dosed uh set of drugs if there's alternative drugs you may be better off with drug a rather than drug b for dealing with the particular condition that you've got, which isn't itself genetically determined, but your genes will alter the way that your drug, your, the drug is metabolized in your body uh, and so on. So those kind of things, I think, I mean, they already are available. They're mainly available in the West for certain very, very specific diseases, but this will become more generalized, partly because the, the cost of sequencing is, is plummeting, which in itself raises all sorts of issues about who owns the genes and you know, uh, uh, you know, identity theft and, you know, a million and one plots of, you know, planting somebody's DNA at the site of a crime or whatever. Um, so those kind of things are already a reality and will become widespread. And the issue will then be, how can we ensure that this technology is equitably distributed? Because as one of the scientists said at the beginning of this, uh, this whole debate in about five, six years ago, we live in a world in which we don't have equal access to eyeglasses. So, you know, something as trivial as that is not equally distributed. There's huge inequalities. Um, and that is gonna ha that's got to be thought about when you develop these things. What will be the consequences for inequalities between, uh, between different people? Um, and I think m more deeply in terms of curing genetic diseases in the body, so in adults, so sickle cell disease, for example. So that's, these are changes that will not be transmitted down the generations. Um, that is going to become far more prevalent. And so there's a whole, at the moment, we're focusing on bloodborne diseases because it's easy to get to the cells. You can get them out and put them back, fiddle around with them, put them back in relatively easily. Um, whereas things in muscles, for example, are much more difficult to, 
to get hold of or neurons in the brain or whatever. But I expect that that will change as well, and we'll find clever ways of delivering these payloads of uh, you know molecular scissors or whatever you scalpels, whatever you want to uh, metaphor you want to use uh, to precisely the right tissue. Uh, so for uh, but you know there's always a, a kind of there's an issue here because we get very excited by these sexy genetic uh, issues. And one of the, one of the very striking things that I, I read about was that we've discovered uh, there's a gene involved for uh, hypercholesterolemia. So it's people who've got high cholesterol levels, very high cholesterol levels, genetically high, you know, you're going to have a stroke or a heart attack. And we can now deliver uh, in, in animal models, so in a, in a monkey, you can deliver a single dose of a particular change to a gene which will that will find its way to the liver and then alter the way that those blood cells those cells are producing uh metabolizing uh, cholesterol and it will effectively cure this high genetically determined high cholesterol but as somebody said in the 90s when they were discussing the pros and cons of gene therapy they said well if we'd known about this 10 years ago we'd never have discovered statins <laughs> We'd well, have simply focused yes. on the gene therapy, whereas, uh -huh. in fact, there are these pills, which I take every night, uh, you know, which keep my cholesterol low. I don't have genetically, this, you know, it's not genetically dangerous, my cholesterol, but it is when I, if I've eaten loads of cheese and stuff. Um, and those statins are as cheap as chips. They cost nothing. And they have saved millions of lives around the world. So sometimes the simple solution might not be as sexy but it's the one that we should go for and it's the one we need to think about building on. So I think the future will hold amazing genetic techniques, but I think they'll also lead to, you know, the spin-off of that might be, okay, we found this gene, it does this. Hmm, we can easily, as they say, and this is easily druggable. We can easily deal with this through a drug, maybe which we already have or which we can identify and develop and treat this in a less invasive, pretend, you know, cheaper way for sure. And that, again, can deal with issues of equitable access to these particular forms of healthcare. Mm hmm Maybe analogously, it'd be, be like uh, providing mosquito nets rather than spending a gazillion dollars trying to reprogram the mosquitoes so yeah. they can't or, breed anymore. <laughs> or, or a vaccine, which is what we now have. I mean, WHO oh, yeah. has just approved a vaccine for, uh, for a vaccine against malaria, which has 80% efficacy, which is far, far wow. lower than COVID, but which will be enough to actually remove malaria because you know if there's no malaria parasites in people the mosquitoes can't transmit it because they emerge without the without the malaria parasite they've got to get it from us they transmit it from person to person as they bite so if you've lowered the amount of malaria through vaccination which it looks like we can do uh this has been this trial has just been approved you know it was very very rapid it worked who has approved it so maybe yeah we the simple solutions are perhaps the ones we should Pay a bit more attention to. Yeah, not quite as All exciting, right, Matthew, but very important. We we can play gods in the in the right way. Here's <laughs> your book again. It's a great read. I listened to the audio version of it. I recommend all you out there listening to this. Get this book. It's a great read. What are you working on next? What's the next big um, project for the next a, couple of years? I'm writing a biography of Francis Crick. And uh, you yes, are. Oh I my am. god. Oh, yesterday good. I was uh, talking to his uh, talking to his daughter and talked about their home life and everything like that. So yeah, right. that's what I'm working on. Right. And nice. Interestingly enough, my good friend uh, Nathaniel Comfort is writing a biography of Jim Watson. So we are currently oh, in, in tandem. <laughs> We're working together. So you, so you could have two biographies, Crick and just call them the Crick and Watson uh, biographies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the moment that uh, we were both working on the fifties, and we are, uh, you know, we're in step, which is fantastic. I but see. we will be soon diverging in time, but uh, probably not in. Well, that's in interesting because you because of that you wrote the book on the brain earlier when you brought yeah. the example of physicists d d diving into biology. Well, Crick went from biology to consciousness. Yeah, well, he went, from, pretty... he went from physics to biology to consciousness. Yeah, neuroscience. Right. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to write the book. Everybody knows pretty much about what he did in, in molecular genetics. But as my brain book emphasized, the, uh, he actually played an, an astonishing role in the last kind of 40, 50 years of neuroscience, actually shaping it, not through any one discovery, but through ideas and articles and pressure and pushing certain developments and i wanted to bring that out in the, in in the biography i'm writing that's a nice example of again sociology of science how these things change you get somebody of crick stature that says you know what it's okay to study consciousness oh absolutely okay. yeah, yeah he's he it's his fault it's his fault <laughs> damn it and all the rest of these people are uh, 
you know, and there's all this hoo-ha about, you know, free will and all the rest of it. Um, if Crick made it respectable, when I was an undergraduate, you know, we laughed, oh, Crick's gone off to, to, to America. He's going to solve consciousness. Ho, ho, ho. Because we didn't think it was an interesting problem. We thought it was, you know, we, uh, not doable and simply an epiphenomenon anyway. Uh, but that doesn't really mean anything, but really not doable. And he convinced people that it was. So we can blame him for a, a lot of arguments. <laughs> that sounds good. All right, Matthew, thanks so much for coming on the show. We went right up to two hours. Very good. Oh, it's a long Super time. Super <laughs> interesting topic. Yeah, no, okay. that's all right. Right, that's great. Thanks a lot, Michael.